Thank you. Hi, I'm April Wright. I am a preventative security specialist. I've been doing this for a really long time. I have a lot of interests um, in uh, OPSEC is one of them, uh, operational security. Um, I have uh, been through this process myself, so I know a lot about it, and um, I decided to write a talk about it after having gone through it, because I'm sure that a lot of people, other people can benefit from it. So um, I should stipulate that I'm not a counselor, I'm not a dog tour, I'm not trained for any of this. <laughs> um, you can find me online at architectsecurity.org, and let's jump in. So there, the inspiration for this talk was a uh, great Schmukan talk, uh, essentially TLDR, um, a friend of the community passed away and they had to do digital forensics on his entire life, um, trying to break into uh, bank accounts, like not break into, but trying to get into bank accounts using social engineering, um, doing all kinds of different um, uh, types of forensics to try to figure out where things were, where is his insurance, what are his passwords, that kind of thing. So um, the the answer was essentially to have a sort of legacy drawer, which is um, maybe not a drawer, but maybe a safety deposit box um, that has the a master password for your password manager and printed copies of important documents, things like that. So that's, that's one of the inspirations. The other one is, um, uh, Having gone through this, it is incredibly tough. Um, so not all breakups are due to abuse and not all breakups leads to stalking. So if you're lucky enough to be peacefully decoupling, this talk will be useful to you still, especially from an OSINT and checklist point of view. Um, you may encounter this situation in the future or you may have a friend that will, unfortunately. So this talk was specifically developed to address hostile breakup scenarios where one person doesn't want to break up when a partner is be being abused or when someone's trying to get away from their partner. Um, much like we consider public Wi-Fi to be a hostile network, we must also consider worst case scenarios and defend against breakup based threats. So even if your partner is not malicious, they may still have personal info about you. Um, there's digital connections and they can also be used as a pivot point for attacks against you. Um, I truly hope that nobody's in this situation um, where you need to escape a relationship, but I also know that's not going to be true. So my heart goes out to each and every one of you. Um, I am a survivor. I just got muted. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, whether you're here for yourself or here to help a loved one understand that these concepts and activities and challenges are difficult, really difficult. But you're here and that's a great step. So this is an official trigger warning. Um, not everyone's gonna be ready to deal with this material. You may be a current victim of cyber stalking or abuse, or you may know somebody who is. Um, this content is not meant to inform and help, but it may not be easy for everyone to watch. So if that's the case for you, please consider watching later when you're in a better mindset or when you're ready to help or when you can pause or stop or resume at your own pace. If you're in danger, call 911, obviously. But don't worry, this isn't going to be that bad. So more inspiration for this talk, um, some st disturbing to statistics. I can never say that word. I won't go into all of them, but one in three women and one in four men will experience a violent partner in their lifetime. And one in four women and one in 13 men will be a victim of stalking in their lifetime. This doesn't even begin to count the number of people who have been sub subjected to non-physical forms of harm, such as mental, verbal, psychological, or financial abuse. So I'm going to start this out kind of mythologically dark. Um, before I start this story, I should note that the trans traditional translation of the Latin word rape or raptus means seized or carry off, carried off and does not specifically refer to sexual violence. So Jean Lorenzo Bernini's statue, Apollo and Daphne, as you can see here, was um, it's an unnerving depiction of unwanted desire. In Ovid's poem Metamorphoses, the Greek god Apollo was an insecure narcissist. Sound familiar? The virgin nymph Daphne does not want to marry anyone. So Cupid shoots two arrows, one that makes Apollo desire Daphne and one that makes Daphne repulsed by Apollo. 
When Daphne realized that, that the stronger and faster Apollo will eventually catch her, she asks her father for help. His solution is to turn her into a laurel tree, like you do, which will make her ugly and impossible to rape. This is kind of symbolic of how um, some people will, uh, specifically women, will wear ugly clothing, baggy clothing, eat compulsively, and try to make themselves less attractive targets. Um, so yet even after becoming a tree, Apollo touches her. She recoils beneath the tree bark to his touch. Ovid explains, he loved her still. He placed his hand where he had believed her heart would be beating under the bark, and he embraced the branches as if they were still limbs and kissed the wood. Daphne, however, still resisted, and the wood shrank from his kisses. She is disgusted with his obsession with her and clearly wants him to leave her space. Yet Apollo does not show any empathy or compassion for this woman who he just hounded into becoming a tree. He declares that the laurel tree will not be his tree. That way everyone will think of him when thinking of the laurel tree. In this way, Apollo completely erases Daphne as even a memory, supplanting her entirely with himself and his narcissism. He uses the tree's leaves as his crown, the laurel crown. And in the Greek language, the word for laurel is Daphne. So sculptor Benini captures the precise, precise moment when Daphne symbolizes um, from a woman to a tree. Apollo grasps at Daphne's torso, which has already begun to take the form of bark, while roots sprout from her toes and erupt from her flowing hair. As she lunges skyward away from Apollo, her body tilts and her open mouth strains. As sco scholar Andrea Bollard put it, even Daphne's expression seems to betray a transformation. The, Fear of being caught gives over to horror at the means by which she will avoid capture. Bernini conveys Apollo's savage sexual appetite through movement. The god's hands flex, the robes threaten to slip off his waist, and a spray of leaves emerges from Daphne pointing to his groin. So I was curious. <laughs> I wanted to see this spray of leaves that was emerging from Daphne that was pointing to his groin that she used to protect herself. So I found another angle and honestly was not disappointed. I personally wanted to do this myself, so kudos. Um, another tale from Ovid's Metamorphosis revolves around the abduction of Persephone. And you might remember this story. Um, she ate six pomegranate seeds while in the underworld, and uh, she ended up having to spend six months in the underworld and six months above ground, and that's how we got seeds. Sure. Um, however, you probably don't realize what a horrific story this actually was. Um, this is also a Bernini sculpture called Pluto and Persephone, and it harbors similar thematic concerns about unaccepted rejection, consent, and violence. So like Apollo and Daphne, the story and sculpture depict the savage sexual hunt of a goddess by a god. Bernini expresses the pain and sorrow as Pluto clutches at her tender skin in the form of an agonized expression and a single tear. These stories' unique ability to convey emotional and physical strain of rejection and stalking is irrefutable. These masterpieces disturbingly depict unwanted pursuit and predatory behavior. If you think this is uncommon throughout history, it's not. Here are some examples from ancient history when documentation was scarce and many stories went untold. This doesn't even begin to approach modern documented history or the things that happen with modern technology. So why have I included these stories? Because relationship violence, threats, stalking, and beyond have been happening since the beginning of time, which doesn't make it right. But what has changed is that we now have a new life online, which allows an entirely easier and larger avenue for victimization. This talk will assume the worst case breakup scenario as its premise. So if you or a loved one is going through something like this, I just wanna say you're not alone again, but pink. So what happens when I do? becomes I do not. So here's a possible hostile breakup landscape. You're dealing with a, a someone who's suddenly untrusted. Um, they are probably fairly technical, technically savvy because most people are these days. Um, you have a, a shared circle of people that you know, um, and they know a lot about you. They probably know your social security number, your birthday, your mother's maiden name, some of your passwords, your banking info. Um, that is basically our threat landscape. So the threat for the, for the person who's being broken up with um, tends to be controlling, manipulative. Uh, they believe that they have the right to uh, oversee all aspects of a relationship. They often see themselves as victims uh, and they will try to keep you from leaving. Um, and they will sometimes even physically keep you 
come leaping. Uh, the cycle of relationship grief, which is denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Um, the Everything before acceptance can be very uh, painful and, and become a nightmare for the victim. Um, grieving partners can quickly go from partner to threat. So the target, the person who's trying to get away, um, they have been through so much normally that um, they have lost self-confidence. They, uh, they don't feel like they're worthy. Um, they may uh, stay in the relationship despite how unhappy they are because they have children or they're dependent on the other person or um, there's community ties that uh, are, do not approve of um, divorce or, or people leaving. And um, it, a lot of abuse and bad relationships involve brainwashing and gaslighting, which uh, will sometimes convince someone that, you know, no one else will ever love you like I do, that kind of thing. Um, so stalking and bullying victims uh, where they don't know the person, so like it's a stranger on the internet, um, they live in fear just like uh, somebody in a relationship um, uh, about uh, with anxiety and fear about what could happen, who is this person, what will they do next? Um, and so there's a lot of risk that we have to manage. So personal risk management, uh, the number one goal, safety, personal safety, keeping yourself safe and alive so that you can build a better life. Um, the next step is protecting your privacy. Um, protecting your privacy can protect your safety. And we'll get into more of that, that later. Um, feeling in control is extremely important. Um, as you transition to independence, uh, you need to feel like uh, you are making the decisions. So um, we need to protect our assets and remove access that the person may have, um, try to avoid surveillance that they may try to implement. Um, and mitigating and minimizing threats from the threat. And finally, monitoring for um, intrusion attempts and ind indicators of stalking, which are a lot like IOCs. Okay, so I'm clearly a goddess, but what does this have to do with security? <laughs> uh, so we live in an interconnected world that is just growing by leaps and bounds with IoT and all kinds of other things. So it's incredibly easy to spy on someone and watch people and um, see where they're going, see what they're doing, and try to sneak back into their lives anonymously. Um, we can't change a lot of our PII. Uh, you can change your name and your social security number and some other things. Um, but uh, if somebody knows your uh, information about you, they could use it against you. So it also allows uh, through social media and other chat platforms for the threat to get in touch with people that you know. Um, and they could do it anonymously, they could do it uh, by pretending or impersonating someone else. Um, we tend to overshare on social media. So um, if you are checking in to the local pizza place, um, they're gonna know where you are. <laughs> they're gonna know where you go. They're gonna know where you go regularly. Um, location tracking is basically built into almost every app and every device um, imaginable, so it, uh, it is a problem. And uh, uh, spycraft gear like hidden cameras and hidden microphones and things like that are readily available to the general public and they're fairly inexpensive. So over time our lives do tend to become digitally intertwined, especially if you live together. When you end a relationship, some of the possible complications are um, moving. So you might be moving to a new city to get as far away as possible. Um, you're gonna have to make new friends, learn uh, new uh, uh, new routes to work. You're gonna have to learn um, where things are. And that is uh, very stressful. Um, even worse, you might have to stay local because of family or kids that are shared. Um, kids are going to bring up a whole separate set of issues because you are probably not going to be able to maintain anonymity for your address and other things because there's going to be court documents and other um, other types of things that happen. So um, you're going to have to put up different kinds of protections. Um, if you own assets and houses and uh, or a house or <laughs> cars or furniture or business even, you're going to have to split that up and you're going to have to um, either buy 
one person might buy somebody else out of the house or you might sell the house altogether. So there's going to be some some back and forth there. Um, and there might be disapproval from people. They may love your partner because they're probably very charismatic and uh, as many narcissists are. Um, so uh, there may be some pushback there as well as religion. Um, you might have shared services like you're going to have to get your own Netflix. <laughs> you might have to get your own accountant. Um, if you have uh, copies of, of important documents, you're going to want to make sure that both sides have them. And you, you may even have shared bank accounts and credit cards and loans and things that are going to have to be decoupled. So let's think about a scorned or unhappy partner as a sort of advanced persistent threat, or APT. The partner who does not want the relationship to end, to end, we'll call them the advanced partner threat. So they have common threats, tactics, and procedures, TTPs, just like a regular APT. So we threat, we fight those with understanding, awareness, and action. When it comes to cyberbullying, um, anything goes. Uh, uh, the most common types of things are messaging um, and uh, and just trying to get in touch with the person. Um, there's also spreading of rumors, uh, sharing uh, uh, photos or videos that are embarrassing. Uh, revenge porn is something that's definitely um, uh, very common in these types of scenarios. Um, they may create uh, harassing websites or fake profiles. That's um, one of the most common. And um, once that content is out there, it is most likely widely distributed and um, hard to uh, to get off the internet. And there's a concept of internet permanency where once it's on the internet, it's forever. So it's probably indexed somewhere or copied somewhere and it's never going to go away. So stalking the victim online, spying on the victim, um, embarrassing them, sending them spam, signing them up for 100,000 spam emails, um, trying to uh, prevent them from uh, being able to do things, social engineering. Um, they may uh, call your uh, work or um, your apartment or something and try to get information about you. Um, they, uh, they may try to um, deface or, um, or uh, do something with your own social media site. Um, they could dox you, they could provide all of your information, um, they could humiliate you, there's all kinds of things that could just be so embarrassing that they could do, even if, even if they're lies. Um, financial control is another interesting one, um, probably less common, but um, they could install ransomware on your computers if they have access. Um, they could extort you. Uh, let's say they do have embarrassing information. Um, they can commit other kinds of fraud or they could take money out of your shared accounts, um, which is embezzlement. So they could be using scare tactics and other types of things. They could hire a third party. They could hire a PI. Um, they could impersonate you to try to, um, to get back into accounts that they've been locked out of, or they could impersonate others to try to reconnect with you. Unwanted phone calls, hang-ups, things like that. Um, gifts, letters, flowers all sound very nice, but um, not when you want the person to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, they could be watching you from a distance, uh, spying with listening devices, the spycraft types of stuff. Um, they could put a GPS tracker under your car and you probably never notice. Um, or even uh, they could be watching you with a drone. I mean, this is 2020. Like, there are so many possibilities. Um, they could approach you or show up at work, which could be incredibly embarrassing or possibly even dangerous. Um, they could show up at your house, uh, school, um, any, anywhere that they know that you're going to be. Uh, leaving threatening things. Um, I'm not talking about like a horse head in the bed. I'm talking about maybe a note in the car that says like, you know, uh, call me or something. Or like I was here, like just kind of showing that they can get to you. Um, or uh, they isolating you from other people um, by impersonating you or telling lies or other types of things uh, also very common. So cyber stalking is the crime of using the internet, email, or other electronic communications to stalk, harass, threaten another person. It most often involves sending harassing emails, instant or text messages, or social media posts, or creating websites for the sole purpose of tormenting the victim. 
What's important about that is that stalking is a criminal act. It's criminal in all 50 U.S. states, um, District of Columbia, territories, and at the federal level, and we'll get into more about that later. So it's usually a prelude to more violent crime. So um, getting involved and intervening before it can become uh, violence, rape, murder, or kidnapping, that kind of thing is really important. Um, it is a serious problem, but unfortunately, until one of those things happen, uh, the people who are prosecuted for this type of thing usually get the minimum sentences. So just to reiterate, the attacks are, tend to be victim manipulation, surveillance, social engineering, eavesdropping, spying, identity theft, trespassing, and these all have vectors that are both in-person and digital. So digital separation goals. Um, number one, uh, safety. Number two, privacy. Um, making sure that you document any negative interactions, and we'll talk about why that's important later, and initiating a hard stop for all communications with them that is not business related, like you have to sign this paper so that um, we can sell the house, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, setting up and uh, monitoring for behavior that is not wanted. So some of the realities of separating, um, you may be scared at times, um, it, you may develop some paranoia that may linger and last for a while. Um, you may do crazy things, <laughs> seemingly crazy things, like closing all your blinds because you think that your partner has, you know that your partner is a drone and you're afraid that they're going to be watching you. Uh, you may have to ease out of the relationship and you may need to be prepared to lie or distract or manipulate your APT to protect yourself. Whatever you have to do, you need to do it to keep your safety. So I'm calling this breakup craft because I think it's cute. Um, so reclaiming your digital identity, moving towards individuality. The first step is not always the actual separation. There are some things you want to think about and do first. So even if you plan to flee in the night, consider the practical things that you can do before you leave to protect yourself. If you have to get away quickly, stay with someone who understands your situation and is willing to protect you. Teach them OPSEC for operational security, even if they don't understand. Um, don't go back for things. Things don't matter as much as your safety. Have a friend or family member go back to get things for you. Do not talk to the person. Cut all ties. They will try to manipulate you, gaslight you, convince you to go back. Make sure you have someone to talk to, someone who you can confide literally everything in, even if it's not the same person that you're staying with. If you hire movers, this is very important, you tell them to not let anyone know where you'll be moving, not just the movers who show up for the job, but also the receptionist. Have them put a note on the job to not disclose any information, talk to a manager if you need to, whatever it makes you feel most comfortable that they're not going to disclose information about you. Um, there is something called a address confidentiality program, which we're about to talk about. Um, but uh, PO boxes now have actual mailing addresses, street addresses, so that you can use them for certain things. So get a, um, a UPS box or USPS box or, or some kind of mail. Um, there's some other uh, ways that you can do it. You can, for people who like live in RVs and they don't have permanent residences, um, you can become a resident of like Texas and you can have all your mail sent there and um, you are essentially, you're being taxed at the Texas rate and some other things. So there's some, there's some interesting uh, things like that um, that uh, you can get into. So uh, confidential address programs. Um, every state has one of these mostly. Um, basically, it is a mail forwarding uh, for you so that um, you never get mail sent directly to your home. You have it sent to this address and then it is resent to you. Um, if you buy a house, there is a paper trail to your location. So there are things that you can do like uh, start a, a living trust or um, and, and have that by the house. Um, renting doesn't usually have that kind of paper trail. But um, if you're very important, if you're going to look into address confidentiality, you have to do it before you move. You can't do it after. Mm -hmm. So access controls for identity. 
you want to change passwords on all your personal accounts, anything shared especially. Um, add uh, multi-factor authentication anywhere that's possible and uh, use something on your phone versus something with SMS because there are certainly ways to, um, to get uh, second SIMs, SIM cards uh, for your phone uh, using social engineering. So randomly generated passwords and password managers for all accounts, never reuse passwords, hopefully you know this, um, and ensure that you know the password recovery answers for all of your shared accounts. So like what was their first dog or um, what, are the, what are the random answers to those things that they use. So make sure that you have all of those things. And then um, change all of the uh, uh, physical things in your home. So let's say you have a uh, Wi-Fi, um, you want to change the name of the Wi-Fi, the password for the Wi-Fi, all of the IOTs um, in your in your home, that kind of thing. So just completely changing passwords all across the board. Login sessions are very dangerous. Uh, so when you log into like Alexa or Home, Google Home or Gmail or Facebook or Instagram or any of these kinds of things, um, these connections persist so that you don't have to log in every time you connect to, you ask Alexa for something. So if you've ever logged into Facebook, uh, the, that session could still be open somewhere. So um, this was a big oof for me. Uh, I had logged into Facebook on a shared computer and um, did not realize that it was still logged in. Uh, there was still access to my account. Uh, to um, either post as me or read things that I had posted that were private or messages, that kind of thing. So um, we're, we're going to go into session detail um, in, uh, in a minute. So <laughs> before you change any passwords, look to see if the service has sessions that are open and close all of them before changing passwords. Um, you're going to have to re-log in, but it's the price that you pay. So social login is kind of a new concept. Um, basically, you go to a website and they say, oh, you want to create an account? Well, you can log in with Google. Or you can log in with, um, with Twitter. Or you can log in with uh, uh, Facebook. And then you don't have to remember another password. But there's a problem with that. Um, so I, this is actually mine. I went in and looked at um, my apps and sessions. And sure, you know, the, there's only one app that's connected to Twitter. Um, but then I noticed uh, there was a login from San Francisco about a month ago, and I haven't been to San Francisco since RSA back in February. So I quickly closed that session. Um, I don't know what, what the deal with that was, but um, it's gone now. Um, in Facebook, uh, you can do the same thing. Um, Spotify, you know, I, I, I use that as, and I have to share that so that I can share music with friends. Um, but, you know, I'm not using it for important things. Uh, so I also made sure that apps, websites, and games and other types of things were turned off. Uh, there's some more um, things under Facebook for business integrations, and I'm not really sure how that um, differs from SSO, but I just went through all of my settings and checked to make sure that they were not allowing um, personalized ads and other types of things. Uh, Google also has something similar. So you basically click on your face in the top right corner, and then it'll show you your devices, and you can review all of those. Make sure that none of them are your APT device. Um, I found this, uh, just like on Twitter, I found this thing, this uh, um, grammar checker, and I was like, I don't remember installing this, so I just removed it. No big deal. Um, there's some other things that you can have an a, account link to, and there's a security checkup. So there, there's um, Google has a lot of tools for locking down your account. So I suggest just playing around in there and trying to see what um, what is available and what's linked, and making sure that you're minimizing that. Um, instead of using uh, social login, um, use app passwords if possible. So like Google makes it so that um, on my iPhone, I can have uh, my Google account uh, for YouTube um, have a special password so that uh, all of my devices can have separate passwords. And, and that's an extra layer of security. Social logins are convenient. You don't have to remember another password. You don't have to put something else in your password manager, but you're also sharing all of the data from 
the uh, the third party back to the social network. And if you're paranoid about how much data the social network already has, this is not going to help. Um, so it takes like 30 seconds to create a new password and put it into your password manager. Facebook should not be your password manager. That's just silly. It it, it will uh, maybe go away one day. It may be unavailable. Um, it Just do it the right way and um, put it in the password manager. So device security. Location services, just disable them completely if you are currently being stalked or have some kind of cyber bullying or hostile breakup situation. Um, if you go to tacobell.com, you can enter your, your zip code manually. They don't have to know your precise location. Um, there's almost no reason to, locate, uh, to turn them on except um, uh, maybe for Macs or something like that, um, especially if you're dealing with a stalker. So consider disabling the Find My Phone feature. Um, if somebody is able to social engineer their way to into um, one of the app, app stores or an account that has access to that, uh, that is very dangerous. So is the $800,000 you're going to spend on a new iPhone, that is nothing compared to the uh, cost of your life and your safety and your feeling of um, feeling of safety. So uh, review all the installed apps and remove any apps you don't use. Um, if you have a family account, and this is very important, um, uh, with both uh, Android and iOS app stores, you can have family accounts that share purchases. Um, they can also usually find phones between the family. So make sure that you completely remove your APT from your family um, so that they can't uh, get into things that you download. That, like, let's say that you downloaded um, a dating app, they might see that and that could throw them over the rails, right? Uh, so encrypt your uh, computers and devices. Um, make sure that you have encrypted uh, hard drives, encrypted phones, um, anywhere that you can encrypt things encrypted. And here's a, a really good link um, about uh, how to do that. More device security, um, get a new phone number. Um, you can get a voice over IP phone number. Uh, change your mobile number. If you have a home number, change it. A lot of people don't. Um, get a voice over IP number that will forward to um, to your uh, actual cell phone number. Um, they are actually pretty good, like Google Voice is actually pretty good at uh, stopping spam, as well as being able to block numbers really easily. Um, get a new SIM card uh, and change your mobile provider. That could be another um, thing that you might want to do just so that they don't know who to contact to try to uh, do like a, a clone SIM attack. Um, add a PIN to the provider uh, so that uh, they, like a verification code, so that um, that only you know, so that that's different than anything you've used before um, to prevent uh, different types of things from happening, like forwarding or changing billing or giving away billing information. Um, biometrics, just remove them all together when you're in a stocking situation. Um, especially fingerprints. Um, they can be used while you're unconscious, and I know that's really dark, but it's true. Um, and then use a VPN on all of your devices. Um, make sure it's one that's offshore and doesn't log. So OPSEC, um, you may want to change your name and or social security number. Uh, this is uh, one of the most common things that people do that are trying to um, escape a bad situation. If you have kids involved, this may not be a step that you take. Um, if you're going to change your social security number, you want to make sure that you change your name first. Um, otherwise, it'll be documented. Um, if somebody asks where you are, where you're from, what you do for a living, give vague answers. Don't tell them, oh, yeah, that's the building I live in. Or, um, you know, just, just be really wary about what you tell strangers because you never know who people are. Um, when you're going out alone, there are apps that you can um, have you and a friend and you tell them basically, I'm going out. Um, uh, if I don't check in within this amount of time and your device will ask you to check in, it will alert them and then they can know your location and things like that. Um, that you can do it with like uh, DMs or messages, but the apps make it really easy. Um, carry a self-defense device if you go out. Um, 
check your local laws. <laughs> like in Massachusetts, you, uh, I believe you need to have a um, like a gun license to have a taser. I think is what I read. Um, brass knuckles. I mean, that, that's questionable too. Um, but like a whistle or pepper spray, those are usually legal. But again, check your local laws um, and um, definitely avoid doing any kind of online dating until this is done because they may try to catfish you or find you in dating um, by targeting certain demographics and things like that. So that that could really be bad. Make sure you don't check into places virtually. Do not write reviews about the places that you go to. Just avoid it. Um, there's no reason to give five stars to the place that you go every morning for coffee because that's going to expose where you're you know, what your habits are. Um, vary your, your routine. Go to a different coffee place every morning. Um, take a different route to work. Uh, don't uh, change gyms. Like, there, you know, there's different kinds of things that you can do to change the, uh, the knowledge that the attacker has about you. Uh, credit cards and financial considerations. Um, get new card numbers. Uh, make sure that if uh, either you're removed from their credit card or they're removed from yours. Um, change the secret word with your bank, like uh, don't use your mother's maiden name, <laughs> please. Use uh, something random that you can pronounce uh, that you store in your password manager. Um, get a new bank, a new bank brand. Uh, that also makes it harder for uh, them to social engineer the bank into giving them information. Um, and uh, as soon as you have a new account start, funding it. Uh, you can usually go into, like if you're a salaried employee, you can split your um, your paycheck into two or more accounts. So start, you know, sending a little bit of money um, if you are planning to leave, that kind of thing, or just completely switch it over if you're you're just done and you're, you're out. Um, ATM pin, uh, it's hard to remember. You probably have the same one forever, but it's worth doing and you should probably do it regularly anyway. Um, freezing your credit, is very important because it means that the uh, attacker can't open accounts in your name while the account is frozen. Now, one of the problems with that is that if you if you don't claim your your account, like your information before they do, they can claim it if they know enough about you. So make sure that you've claimed all three bureau freeze accounts um, that today. Just I mean, everybody should do that and then put uh, credit freezes on and only remove them if you need to do like a check for um, for like an apartment or, or a loan for a house or something like that. <sighs> Social media, oh my gosh. So just assume anything posted online is could be public at any time. We've seen this with um, Instagram and some other uh, different platforms where uh, private things were made public. That being said, um, you can review the privacy options of your social media account, uh, like have a completely private Instagram. Um, you can also you know, avoid posting to Instagram potentially while you're dealing with something. Uh, go through your friends list and remove anyone that um, is closer to the uh, APT than you are. Um, you don't need to show your phone number on Twitter. You don't need to show your birthday on Facebook. Um, it, it's just, just don't just don't show that just share as little as possible um, use a voice over IP number for um, signing up for different things and you can get different ones for different accounts as well um, and you can create groups for different types of friends so that you can only share certain things with um, people that are in your family group or whatever but again assuming everything that is posted online uh, could be made public at any time don't accept friend requests from people that you don't know, or um, if it is someone you think you might know, contact them out of band to uh, verify. Warn people around you what you're going through. Um, you don't have to go into a lot of detail, just tell them that, um, you know, don't give away any information about you to anyone for any reason right now because you're having an issue. Um, avoid polls and quizzes. I mean, that's kind of my general advice anyway. <laughs> Don't post photographs that might indicate your location. Um, this is like one of the number one offset things is when you take a photo, look in the background, look in the reflections, look uh, look at for landmarks, uh, anything that could ex expose where you are, um, as well as uh, making sure that when you share your data and uh, iPhone has a new feature for this, you share it without um, 
uh, without the location data. And if you have location data turned off, it won't even be uh, part of the photo anyway. Um, don't overshare uh, private events, uh, thoughts, locations, um, and you can go back and limit old posts too. Um, one thing that I do frequently is OSINT myself. So I look at my own footprint, and it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. Um, I use Maltigo. Uh, I close information exposure points that, um, like old accounts, I found like an old Tumblr account once, and I'm like, I don't know. Don't use that. So to totally delete it, um, you can hide, uh, unsubscribe, and go to uh, like these people search sites, and you can opt out. Um, sometimes you have to give them more information than, uh, than they may already have, but it's worth it to get it removed um, from from the general public. Um, this is not going to keep like you know the government from finding you, but this is going to keep like the average person from being able to find you on the search sites. Spend about, a, I personally spend about an hour a week doing this, um, maybe every two weeks. Um, so uh, there's a great resource uh, from inteltechniques.com uh, where um, it gives a list of all the search sites and how to opt out. Uh, there's also a privacy checklist from Intel Techniques. Michael Basil has some fantastic resources. So definitely check these out. Um, protect your life, cover your tracks, trust but verify, change all physical locks as well as your passwords, um, create an air gap between shared personal networks. So, um, you know, friends of his, friends of yours, friends of theirs, friends of yours, I should say, um, and uh, warn others in writing if you're in danger. So I once told my boss, if I don't show up for work, send help. <laughs> like if I don't call you or show up for work, I'm in trouble. Um, Here's some information about changing your social security number. Like I said, if you're going to change your name, do it before you apply for a new number. I don't know how this works in UK or other parts of the world. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so detection. Um, you can set up new login notifications for important websites, um, uh, notifications for withdrawals from or payments from your bank. Uh, tell your neighbors and other people, like if anybody suspicious is seen, like let me know. Um, you can set up personal surveillance, like body cameras or um, you know household cameras, things like that. You may give up some privacy for that, but if something happens, there's a record. Um, you can set up Google alerts for your name, and but most importantly, whatever alerts you set up, review review them. Don't just ignore them. Don't delete them. So some indicators of compromise are unexpected new login notifications, unexpected bank transfers. Um, somebody reports suspicious behavior, there's a notification from your camera that says that it's on movement. Um, uh, unexpected credit alerts. So if it, um, you probably have credit monitoring from some breach <laughs> that happened to some company where they had they gave out free credit monitoring. If you don't uh, pay for it, um, it's definitely worth it. Um, or if an unrecognized app shows up somewhere, um, you know, that's also an indicator. There are some preventative and detective entry controls like door jams with or without alarms. Um, there are some uh, various things that can keep uh, doors from opening. Um, the one on the left I use in hotels, uh, especially around DEF CON. <laughs> um, uh, the, if you are in an apartment and you can't install external cameras, this, uh, the ring peephole camera is um, really good. There's also Simply Safe. It's not like a lot of installation. Um, uh, Nest cameras, uh, cloud recording uh, notifications, put them all around anywhere you need them. Uh, car cameras, very important too. Um, if you drive, uh, I mean, for even if you aren't being stalked, it's a really good way, idea to have a 360 front and back dash cam um, and make sure you set the timestamps on these things so that uh, they're accurate. I'll, Check your local laws, find out if you're a two-party consent state, but you may want to record threatening phone calls. Uh, here's some devices. Uh, so why do we want to keep the evidence? Um, in case we want to seek a protective order or go for custody or press charges or enforce victims' rights. We want to document everything. Emails, interactions, save this, if there's a, a, a website set up about you that's uh, exposing things, uh, print it out, save it as PDF, it may go away. Um, same thing with uh, social media posts. So um, 
if your data is compromised you or uh, ransomware or something, you, having hard copies of that is also important. And make sure that there's a date and timestamp. Um, you can usually print headers that have those for websites and stuff. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, things are ephemeral on the internet, so just make sure that you keep records. Uh, victim laws, every state and federal, like we talked about, have some sort of victim laws. Um, usually the federal laws involve uh, someone crossing borders, um, like a state or uh, international, and uh, the FCC gets involved when there's uh, telephones and things like that involved. Um, but the key thing is that they must uh, either commit a crime or have intent to commit a crime. Um, and so that can be a little bit difficult to prove. Uh, so what's the difference between a restraining order and a protection order? A restraining order is for like a stranger um, or someone who's not in a relationship with you. But a protection order is like a civil protection order or stay away order. It keeps people away from you. Um, keep, like, you know, you have to be a certain distance from you or not go to your work or that kind of thing. Um, there are, uh, you can do it on your own, but victims advocates will help you do it. So um, if you just look for that resource on the internet, there are a lot of them. Um, the victims rights are uh, listed here. I'm not gonna list all of them, but um, these are the general ones that um, you can uh, get your personal property back if they keep it. Um, they, You can get compensation if they do, uh, damage that costs money, um, or even potentially if you're harmed and have ended up in the hospital, um, and you uh, have the right to be protected. So don't be afraid. Um, just be proactive and reactive. If you're in danger, call the police. Um, get a protective order. Recognize the TPPs. Um, reach out if you need help. Cannot stress that enough. Tell others what's going on. Talk to your friends and family. Reestablish your support network. One of the uh, keys to getting out of a relationship, uh, well, what, there's two. One is a termination and the other is having a support network. Um, so it, it's painful, but um, there's hope. And there's especially hope if you have a support network. So trolls, just ignore them. It's another form of cyber stalking and bullying. Don't feed them, just ignore them. So why do people do these things? I don't know. Um, it's usually because they don't want to be hurt, uh, so they hurt you. It's kind of backwards and broken. Um, this, the grief cycle um, for yourself to speed it up, uh, therapy. I highly recommend therapy. Um, just making changes, hard work. Um, it's going to be, it's going to take time. Um, disconnecting from the person, uh, it's still going to take time. Um, meeting new people and like trying life hacking other types of things are also useful um so gaining determination to leave just look at your situation um realize how strained and drained you are and how unhappy you are in the relationship um look for the signs that we talked about like gaslighting and manipulation um and just realize that you're brave and you can do anything so there's way too many resources for this talk so i'm gonna kind of feed through them so we can get to questions. Um, Maltigo is a great resource. Um, it's got a little bit of a learning curve, but I this is mine <laughs> um, in, in various forms. So basically, um, I put in my, uh, my email address here, and then I can check, and it checks have I been pwned. Um, it links to my, uh, my address, and it found a hashtag orange team, which is something associated with one of my previous talks. So. Um, interesting that it found that. Um, I'm not going to show all of the, the various aliases and things that I put in here that I know about myself. Um, these are some really good uh, resources. So Michael Basil, once again, four out of five of these. Thank you, Michael. These are amazing, um, very, very good books. Uh, uh, I mean, just a wealth of information. Um, victim resources, there's all kinds of websites. Um, I mean, uh, if you are uh, living with someone, you might want to do like a Tor browser session or uh, even a private browser session just so that these don't show up in your search history as another OPSEC type of thing. Um, if you're looking for ways to, um, uh, to get out or hide your tracks. So I want to say that you are not alone if you are going through something like this and you might feel isolated. 
And you might be thinking like, this is so overwhelming to have to do all of these things to reclaim my digital identity. But you're not alone and people will help you and people in this community will help you and people in all communities will help you. There are so many resources out there to help people that are going through um, nightmare scenarios uh, digitally with um, uh, identity theft, things like that. So that's my talk. Um, I really wanted to credit the person who took this photo, um, but it's been used so many times I couldn't find them. Um, so if you want to human with me, I'm at April Wright on Twitter and um, uh, DM me or uh, my email address was earlier on the slides. Um, that's my talk. And I hope you never have to go through any of this, but um, if you do, just know that there is hope. So do we have any questions? Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much. This is, a, this is kind of a tough topic to talk about, so um, just thank you for for being able to like present it in a way and, and combine everything together and and just easy for people to consume. And you know, like you said many times, if anyone out there is going through this or knows someone that's going through this, you're not alone. And you know, if you're in a position to be an advocate and support them, just you know, do everything that you can to try and help people. Um, so that's all that I'll say just to, to support that. We do have a couple questions coming in, but um, the first one that I'll say is from Investigator Chick from Discord. Investigator Chick or, or Cheek, um, there is a fourth credit bureau as well. It's Innovis. So creditreporting.com forward slash Innovis is a fourth credit bureau. Um, I did not know that. That's good to know. Yeah, I, that's kind of the sentiment that a lot of, a lot of folks are getting online uh, in there. Um, so there is a fourth one. Um, First question is from Snoochie Boochies. Uh, do you have any recommendations for blue teams to combat or detect when they are being socially engineered for cyber stalking? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think training is going to be the key here. There's not going to be like a blinky box that you can install that's going to detect uh, these kinds of things. Uh, one thing that you could detect potentially is somebody calling um, from different uh, phone numbers trying to um, ask about the same account that could possibly be correlated. Um, or uh, if you wanted to do some kind of programmatic thing, um, uh, you could, uh, um, if, a, if a certain profile has been accessed uh, to a bunch of times in like the same day or same week or whatever, that could be something that you could look for. Um, but I think training and just understanding uh, the kind of, so there's certain ways that people will do things like they'll give you a little bit of information and then they, you give them a little bit of information and then they, they call back again and they have more information. So just understanding how that works and, and just because somebody gives you a little bit of information doesn't mean that they are who they say they are. So that I think that training is, is just is the most important thing. There's some correlation that you can do correlation yes correlation that you can do um with uh like if you if you're putting all these things into like a, a log manager or something but um yeah just just awareness great um, another question is from the same person uh, opinions on sites and services like delete me reputation defender uh, etc i've never personally used them because i want to be in control of um of what information I provide to the sites that have all of that information. On the other hand, on the, like on the other hand of that coin is that they uh, have auto, more automated ways to do it and they probably know about all of the new uh, people finder sites and advertising sites and things like that. Um, so uh, I, they usually cost a lot of money. Um, so it, it's kind of dependent on your situation. Um, you know, it, it's like, uh, do you implement the freeware version or do you, do you buy the, you know, off the shelf software and um, it's sort of like a, a black box where you don't know what's going on um, or are you in control? But there's, I could have human error and I may not know about all of the sites that are out there. They may be watching dark web for, um, for uh, compromised emails and passwords and things like that, that um, your password manager should be able to do that, but um, you know they. It, it depends. It depends on on how private you want to be. Because let's say that that company got breached, <laughs> then they would have all of your information, and you know it's just a it's another layer, um, like having a, a 
a password manager, basically. Um, it, it's who do you trust, who do you want to have your information, and, and how much control do you want to have over it? Awesome, thanks. Uh, another question from JMCG. In a slide about Google account security, you mentioned apps with access to your account. Uh, your example surprise was a grammar checker, uh, which is pretty scary. Which is a pretty scary vector for persistent stalkerware. Two questions about that. First, do you know if Google makes any effort to identify apps in their ecosystem that are effectively stalking, especially those that present a benign purpose, like checking grammar? And then number two, can you think of any other services which have this kind of third-party app integration that we should be aware of? And then also just wanted to add in great talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know about what they do internally to vet their apps. Um, a lot of the, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, some app stores or marketplaces do vet their vendors. Um, some have so many that it's impossible. So I think pretty much anybody can implement the Google uh, single sign-on um, social login kind of thing. So um, I, I don't think they're really checking every single website that's using it. Um, it could be a malware site or you know something. That I, I, they may have some sort of back-end thing looking at uh, what uh, same kind of way that they that you have like URL filtering and stuff like that. They may be doing a little bit of that, but um, I, I think it's better to just check on it regularly. Um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that I signed up for this stupid grammar thing like I, I'm sure that it was me it's just I don't remember doing it and I don't think it was malicious at all it was just surprising to see it there um, which is why I included it because I mean even me even I am susceptible to this type of stuff um, but yeah uh, anything that that's a key logger um, uh, yeah I that that is um, very suspicious. I would think that anything that would want to have access to your email, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> like any kind of plugins for like Gmail, just be really careful, like that kind of thing. Um, uh, email, keystroke loggers, uh, anything that asks for your location. Like I, I'm constantly getting these like pop, these little drop down things on my browser that are like, uh, sh share your location. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, why? I'm not, it, it has nothing to do with anything. It's like a news site or something. Like I don't need personalized local news. I can find that on my own. So yeah, I, it's just, you just have to be vigilant, I think is the key. And I, I don't know that there's anything that can programmatically protect you from all these different types of things. Um, I would say that uh, if, somebody does have physical access to your uh, computer to you know check your cables once in a while and see if there's a new little uh, USB uh, adapter or something that could be a keylogger um, using a VPN it, you know in case somebody's got like a pineapple and they're doing um, they're spoofing a, a Wi-Fi um, just you know being very careful I don't have a, a better answer than that I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think that's great. Uh, so we are unfortunately right at the end of the time. I just want to say thank you again very much uh, for for the talk. It was 